meeting today again at one o'clock. I'd encourage you to try to um, watch this every day or watch it later in the day. We try to provide you with the most up-to-date information to keep yourselves and your families safe uh, and to have some kind of a connection as we deal with the coronavirus. Um, as you can see from the data that's on your screen or will shortly be on your screen, we are still seeing an increase day over day in the number of cases, the number of deaths, unfortunately, and the number of hospitalizations. So we're still uh, ascending towards the peak, which we think will happen, you know, last week of April, first week of May, approximately. Uh, but the very good news is that due to all of your hard work and sacrifice, we aren't seeing the um, steepness of the curve that we had been seeing a week or two ago. And so that just goes to show that all of your sacrifice, the mask wearing, the staying at home is working, is saving lives, and is getting us that much closer to a place where we can return to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. I also want to give you a reminder on your contact tracing notebook. I will be very honest, yesterday I realized that I had gone a couple of days without jotting into my contact tracing notebook, uh, my contacts, so it was a little wake-up call for myself, and I figured maybe you could use a reminder yourselves. We are at a place now where um, we're testing over 2,000 people a day, pretty much the highest rate in America of any state. And if you are tested positive, you will immediately be contacted, or very soon thereafter, by the Department of Health, and they will ask you for all of the names of the people you've been in contact with in the past days. And at that time, I need you to pull out your contact tracing notebook so we can have an accurate accounting of who you've been in touch with. So it takes a daily discipline and vigilance um, as I said, I forgot, so I had to go back and try to remember and fill in the blanks. So this is my reminder to each of you, please, every day, take a second or two, jot down where you've been and who you've been in contact with. And remember, the goal right now is to be in contact with the same few people every day. That's the single most important thing we can do to uh, limit the spread of the disease. Uh, Probably like many of you, I woke up today a little bit shocked and a little sad to see snow. It's supposed to be spring and it's snowing, so I want you to know on your behalf, I called Mother Nature and told her to knock it off and send us some warm sunny weather because uh, we need to get outside and start our gardening and go for a walk around the block. Okay, a few uh, announcements. Uh, some good news, I'd like to begin with some good news. Uh, on account of the very hard work of our federal delegation, you know that a few weeks ago, Congress passed a $2 trillion federal stimulus package. $1.25 billion of that is coming to the state of Rhode Island to help us deal with our COVID-related expenses. And the good news is that yesterday, half of that, $625 million, landed in the state's bank account. Uh, that is a welcome relief. It is much needed. Um, obviously, like, like many of you, your income is drying up. Our revenue has dried up precipitously. And also, we're spending money to deal with the crisis. So I want you to have some hope and confidence to know that we've received $625 million from the federal government. The remainder of that will be coming in the next couple of weeks and we need it, and we'll put it to good use. We're still waiting for the Treasury Secretary, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, to provide us with the guidelines and regulations around how we can spend that money, but uh, we know it's for COVID-related expenses, and it is certainly a relief to have it in the states, on the state's balance sheet. I want to take a second to sincerely thank our federal delegation for the part that they played in making this happen for Rhode Island. Uh, Senators Reed and White House have been in great contact with me the entire time and have been quite literally fighting for Rhode Island in the United States Senate. The same is true for Congressman Langevin and Congressman Cicilline, 
both have been in regular contact with my office asking how they can help, what they can do. They've all four have been outstanding servants to the people of Rhode Island. And so I want to thank you guys for your work and let you know that I take comfort in knowing that the four of you are in Washington fighting for us. And we are all grateful um, for the $1.25 billion and, and the role you played in advocating for the advance of half of that to arrive in our bank account. You've been outstanding. And to each and every one of you, thank you. Special thanks to Senator Reid, the most senior member of the delegation, who's quite literally in the room with Secretary Mnuchin um, crafting this and making sure Rhode Island gets its fair share uh, of the stimulus. So thank you all. It's been, on a personal level, a pleasure for me to deal with each of you. You've been fantastic partners and friends to me, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, earlier this week, I signed an executive order issuing clear direction about face coverings. I signed the executive order on Tuesday and announced at that time it would become effective today on Saturday. My thinking was that it's a change for businesses, a change for all of us, and I wanted to get, give everyone a few days to um, get yourselves organized and in a position to be able to provide employees with masks and for employees to get used to it. So uh, it's effective today in the state of Rhode Island is an executive order as follows. All employees of customer-facing businesses office-based businesses, manufacturers, nonprofits, and construction workers, that's essentially everyone who is going to work in an office, uh, must wear cloth face coverings the entire time that they are at work. Additionally, all customer-facing businesses must take steps to remind their customers to wear face coverings. It doesn't mean you can turn customers away, but I want you to do everything you can as customers are coming in verbally and with signage to remind all your customers that they, sh they must be wearing a face cloth covering that covers their nose and their mouth at the time that they come into your establishment. The only exceptions uh, for this are anyone whose health would be in jeopardy because of wearing the face covering or children under two years old. And frankly, if your health would be in jeopardy for wearing a face covering, you should not be leaving your home. And if you need a hand getting groceries or getting out and about, get in touch with us and we can help you do that. Uh, this, is, this is weird. There's no other way to say it. I've heard from a lot of you saying, do I really have to do this? Does it really make a difference? It feels strange. It's hard to breathe. Um, the answer is yes. Don't look for ways to get around the rules. Look for creative ways to follow the rules. Wearing a, fa a cloth face mask will not prevent you from getting the virus if you are in close proximity to somebody who has it. It will, however, go a long way in preventing you from spreading the disease to somebody near you. So basically, I'm asking each of you, all of us, to sacrifice to help out the rest of Rhode Island. That's what this is about. This is about the, each of us being put out and inconvenienced in order to help everybody else. And it will limit the spread of the disease. That's a fact. So I'm asking you to get creative, figure out um, the best way that you can comply. But as of today, it is official that this is what I'm requiring businesses to do and everyone to do when, they're, when they are shopping and if you're an employee uh, who has to go into work. Uh, DBR, Department of Business Regulation, will be doing random spot checks of businesses starting today to make sure that there is compliance and they have my authority to go ahead and issue additional regulations, including fines and other enforcement mechanisms, if, if we feel that businesses and individuals aren't complying. So um, let's do it. Let's just do it. It's not fun. It's not easy. It's not what any of us wants to do. But we know it'll work. So let's make it happen. And let's keep Rhode Islanders safe and healthy. Uh, I want to take a second to address the art community, the arts community. Uh, I would say that 
uh, there's so many folks struggling right now, and I am trying to be mindful myself of those who are the most vulnerable. And I am fully aware that nothing we are doing um, is perfect or is, is really enough. Like we're trying our best, every day we get better, we, we're trying to, to do more and better testing in inner cities, we're, we're working like crazy in nursing homes, we're trying to reach out to people who are struggling with mental illness and addiction, like we're, we're trying the homeless, and we are conscious, we're conscious that we can't get to everyone, but we're conscious that there are certain groups out there struggling a bit more than the rest of us. And one of those groups is artists, and I'd like to take a second to draw a bit of attention to that. I will say that um, Rhode Island's art and culture scene is a real point of pride for us. We punch far above our weight when it comes to um, the level and quality and number of artists that we have in our state, and it's part of what makes our state vibrant and fabulous and edgy and, and really a cultural center. But the reality is right now, our galleries and studios and stages are dark. So if you're trying to make a living as an artist, it's, it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, and it's another part of the terrible reality that we are dealing with. Thankfully, we have expanded unemployment insurance benefits, and I would encourage every one of you to apply. Um, you're eligible now if, you, if you're self-employed, even though you typically aren't, so please go ahead and apply. But I also want to draw attention to a relief fund that's been established. It's called the Rhode Island Artist Relief Fund, and it awards grants of up to $1,000 to help artists, art teachers, arts administrators, and other freelance arts and culture workers um, to get through these tough times. The fund was launched recently by the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts. Thank you, thank you to Randy and all of you, uh, in partnership with the Rhode Island Foundation. Thank you again, Neil, for being so fantastic through this. And uh, Providence's Mayor Jorge Alorza and the city's Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. I also would like to thank the Alliance of Artist Communities, which is a national organization uh, that'll be managing and maintaining the fund. After only two weeks, the fund has moved quickly to disperse about $126,000 to help about 250 artists throughout the state. On an individual basis, we know the needs out there are clearly much, much greater, and $1,000 is I realize a drop in the bucket, but it's something. It's something, and I hope you'll take advantage of it, and I'm deeply grateful for all of the entities that came together to uh, find that solution. I will say, if you are one of the fortunate Rhode Islanders out there who is still working and in a position to make a donation of any size, I'd ask you to please do that. Make, make a donation to this fund. You can go to artistcommunities.org and search the Rhode Island Artist Relief Fund and make a donation. And if you're a local artist in need of support, and you're hearing me say this, go to the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts website and you can figure out how to file an application. Um, every little bit helps, and as I say, the artists in our community are part of what make this place special. So please give if you can, and don't be shy about reaching out for help if you need it. Uh, although there is snow on the ground today, it is still spring, and I think tomorrow is going to be beautiful, which means we are hearing from many of our local smaller garden centers who are who usually reopen at this time of year and they are inquiring as to whether they're allowed to open their garden centers now that spring is upon us. Um, so I've, I've heard you, I'm hearing you, and I want you to know that I've directed DBR, Department of Business Regulation, to work with DEM to address this issue and figure out a safe way for you all to uh, open your businesses. By Monday, we'll be issuing guidelines that will enable garden centers in Rhode Island to open by April 27th, but with restrictions designed to keep everybody safe. 
Uh, I want to thank the, I want to thank DEM, Janet Coy, it's fantastic. She's been leading this and in touch with the owners of garden centers. And I want to thank the garden centers for reaching out to us. You did exactly the right thing. You want to open, you should be able to open, and you want to work collaboratively to do it in a way that reduces crowds and enables us to have appropriate social distancing. So on Monday, we're going to issue some guidelines that'll tell you how you can reopen by April 27th. In the meantime, starting tomorrow, Sunday, I'm requiring uh, big box stores that have garden centers to close their open browsing and shopping options within their garden centers. And I'm requiring them to restrict their garden centers sales to pickup, delivery, and appointment options. Um, it, this is, we've unfortunately continue to hear way too many uh, instances of crowded garden centers and people just too cramped and in too close to one another. So uh, we want you to be able to go buy your garden supplies and big box retailers can still sell, but it must be done um, appointment only, pick up a delivery or curbside pickup. And it, again, we, I hope by April 27th, you can all be opening um, for business under a new set of regulations. That mention of garden centers is a good segue into what we will be talking a lot about next week, which is reopening our economy. Um, in getting us to this point, we have taken, I have taken a fact-based targeted approach to how we've done things. That's how we've closed our economy. It's been incremental, changing when we need to, being flexible, responding to the facts on the ground. And that's how we will reopen our economy. Thoughtfully, in a pinpointed way, incrementally, with guidelines by industry. Uh, I have asked Commerce Secretary Stephen Pryor to lead this work. He's already been spending weeks on it, planning, planning, working with me and our other teams, talking endlessly to um, members of the business community. Our goal is to reopen as soon as possible, as is safe, with new restrictions, industry by industry in phases. And we're going to have a lot more to say about that every day next week. Uh, our approach in doing this is, go, I want you to know, is going to be very inclusive. We're going to be, as we have been, in very close contact with chambers of commerce, um, larger businesses, the Rhode Island Partnership, which is a collection of the state's largest companies, uh, small business associations, the Hospitality Association, the Manufacturers Association, uh, labor unions, public sector and private sector, uh, making sure we're reaching all communities, Black Business Association, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, getting into the smallest businesses. Rhode Island has um, a, a, a very high percentage of Rhode Island's economy is in small businesses. Unfortunately, that has been who's been hit the hardest in this, is the smallest businesses. So we also have to be very thoughtful. It's not just about reopening our big companies and our biggest manufacturers, although we want to do that. It's about being very attentive to the needs of our smallest businesses as well. So uh, I'm saying that, first of all, to say thank you. You've been incredible, Hospitality Association, Manufacturers Association, Chambers of Commerce, some of our big employers, small employers. You've been phenomenal partners. We've been in close, close touch with you. But uh, we, we also need you to stay very, very engaged because we can't develop these guidelines in a vacuum. We'll be developing the guidelines in consultation with other states and business associations and the federal administration, running them by you for your feedback before I go ahead and, and promulgate anything. So that's by way of 
telling you what's to come, thanking you for the work you've already done, letting Rhode Island know it'll be a very inclusive approach, and previewing for you, um, you know, where I expect to be guiding us over the weeks and months to come.